thoughts on the romantic relationship. Um, attending to, uh, it's, it's a relationship. I think synchronistic experience is an invitation to a relationship uh, with the mystery of life. And in this case, it, it, there's an aesthetic uh, delight and nourishment, but it also provides a kind of ongoing spiritual uh, nourishment and a sense of orientation of living in a world that you are at home in. And then uh, finally, um, in this third stage, I'd say there's also the potential, and this is what Jung specialized in, to use the synchronicity to compensate for the one-sidedness of your conscious attitude. And so I'll just give this example, and then uh, I know we started late, but I, I don't want to go over uh, our allotted time here. So in this, um, this case, there was someone named uh, Heinrich Fierz in Switzerland. I came across this story when I was in, in Zurich and had been I was actually looking for Tony Wolf's birth data at the uh, Jung Institute Library there. Came across this little book that of all things had been published by the San Francisco Jung Institute. Uh, and it was called Remembrances of C.G. Jung, Emma Jung, and Tony Wolf. One marvelous little book. And in it, a story is told, a remembrance by Heinrich Fierz who had an appointment to see Jung. He was, he was, this was in the 1950s, so Jung would have been either in his late 70s or early 80s, around the same period he was writing Memory Streets Reflections. And he, uh, the appointment was for 5 o'clock, and they were to discuss whether a manuscript that had been left behind by a, a, a scientist after his death should be published. So they had the appointment, Fierce comes in and talks to, uh, sits down with Jung, and they're having a conversation. And after a fairly short while, uh, Jung is uh, convinced that the manuscript should not be published as a book, and urges uh, that decision to be uh, made by the publisher as well. Uh, but the conversation went on for some time, and because Heinrich Fierce was not so convinced, and so he was pointing out these other things. And finally, Jung got uh, starting to get a little sharp in his response. And he looked at his watch, and um, he said, that's odd. Uh, what time does your watch say? And Heinrich said, um, 5.35. And uh, Jung said, well, what time did we start? He said, 5 o'clock, as, as we had uh, our appointment. He said, well, your watch is correct. I just had my watch completely revisioned, as he put it, by the uh, Swiss watchmakers. It was completely working perfectly, but my watch is wrong and your watch is right. Let us start this conversation again. <laughs> and they did. And in a very short time, Jung was convinced that he had been misjudging the situation and that the book indeed should be published. Now, I give you this example because this is exactly how Jung used synchronicities in his, in his everyday life. First of all, it shows how, number one, he's able to see symbolic, he's, he's got a symbolic eye, an archetypal eye, he is uh, uh, James Hillman's term. He's able to see, there's, this, there's a stoppage of the watch, a malfunction of the watch, that coincides with what looks like to be the stoppage and malfunctioning of my thinking, of my thought processes. There's a parallel there. And noticing this makes me reconsider that. So he's basically using the synchronicity as a kind of expression of, of his own unconscious. But if you recognize that for Jung, by this point, his sense of the unconscious was not like this thing that was inside his cranium. It, the unconscious was the anima mundi. The unconscious was everything that he was not conscious of, but that didn't make it unconscious, period. It was more, it's the, it's the larger matrix of meaning and purpose and um, uh, value that is all around us in the ensouled world. And, uh, and so messages, as it were, that come in the form of synchronistic coincidences, for Jung, 
he could use them in the same way he used dreams, which is to compensate for the narrowness of the conscious attitude of the ego. Uh, so it was very, so what he did here was simultaneously, he's got the capacity for reading things symbolically. He could read, he could see that parallel, he could see the archetypal principle, the clock, the, the scene stopped clocks and people coinciding with people's deaths, and here was the dead scientist, and here's the this, this ceasing to think clearly and accurately, etc. He's, he's linking it all together in a, in a very quick, uh, symbolically um, saturated cognition. But secondly, he is open to the possibility that the world itself carries meaning. He doesn't see it as just being a human phenomenon. He's made that change, and so he's capable of reading like a, like a Chinese sage or like a, 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 a I Ching or the, or the um, a shaman. He's able to walk through the, the, the forest and grasp the larger meaning of what the birds and the, for, the forest are, are telling him. And thirdly, he is using this not to build up his own, um, his own egotistical importance and that kind of narcissistic inflation that is possible with synchronicities and that the New Age has some susceptibility to doing. Uh, I'm so important, the whole world is focused on me. Uh, that kind of inflation. And instead, Jung is recognizing that, as he put it, um, the proper interpretation of a synchronicity often involves a defeat for the ego and a victory for the self. Capital S. Makes that important distinction.